Okay, Libon, uh, we now switch to the, our second keynote speaker, uh, Professor Darren Asimoglu. He will be online with us from, uh, from the United States, from the MIT. Uh, Professor Asimoglu, he's, um, he's um, uh, J Elizabeth and James Killian, Professor of Economics at the MIT. He's known to us through his uh, numerous uh, writings, and uh, I know it's his famous uh, uh, Why Nations Fail, that we sometimes have to go back and read again and again. So with this uh, very quick introduction, I will give the, um, the stage to uh, Professor Asamoglu for his keynote speech. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be uh, joining you. Unfortunately, I can't be there in person, but uh, uh, <clears throat> nevertheless, I hope uh, this exchange of ideas will be useful. I'm going to share my screen for, uh, oops, I think I need to be enabled to share my screen uh, to be able to do that. Uh, the participants are not allowed to share their screen right now. Uh, it's okay, now okay, now I can do it. Okay, now I can do it. Perfect. So the area of uh, <clears throat> rethinking fiscal policy is a broad one, but I'm actually going to broaden it even further. And I want to talk about remake, remaking the post-COVID world, and I'm going to put fiscal policy into that context. And uh, there are going to be two, uh, three major themes in my brief talk. First, that all of the problems that I'm going to talk about were present before the pandemic, but the pandemic has deepened them and hopefully will act as a wake up call. Second, that the uh, problems are related to inequality and creating shared poverty, which has technological as well as institutional aspects. And third, that there are ways forward in changing our institutions and fiscal policies in order to do that. Let me show you some data uh, from the US, but similar data apply to many other countries. Uh, this is the uh, growth of labor demand, wage bill, private sector wage bill. And on the left, you see what it did in the four decades that followed World War II. And this picture is the same throughout Europe and North America and other developed nations. There were, this was the four decades that were golden for the whole world. Growth was very rapid and was driven by productivity. And it was shared with labor. And I'll show you in a second how it was shared within labor. But then we see something remarkable on the right. Over the last three decades, labor demand, essentially how much private sector is paying to labor, uh, is first slowing down. And then it's essentially flat from 1999 onwards. This is a remarkable picture. It has many implications. One implication, of course, some people have noted that already, is the decline in the share of labor in national income. Much more income goes to capital, and I'll come back to that again. But a second implication may be even more important because it is at the root of many of the uh, social problems that we're having in the developed world, which is inequality within the population. In the United States, where labor market institutions are weak and minimum wages are very low, collective bargaining has disappeared. This shows itself as wage inequality. In many countries in Europe, it shows itself as employment inequality. But let me focus on the US picture. You see that in the first two decades, or the, I'm actually starting this picture from 1960s, uh, when labor demand was growing very rapidly, all demographic groups benefited from it more or less the same. So what I'm showing here is the real wages or the evolution of real wages starting from uh, some base in 1963 for men and women and five education groups. And you see that all education groups and all men and women are benefiting from it more or less equally. Their, grow, their real wages are growing over 2% a year, which is a phenomenal uh, growth rate. And the, this is the baby boom generation. The grandparents of the baby boom generation would not have believed that we can have, you know, 40 years of such steady uh, uh, and equal growth. But then around sometime in the early 1980s, late 1970s, the picture starts changing. You have a huge increase in inequality. But even more importantly, you see the red and the orange lines on the left, those are the real wages of low education workers, workers with high school degrees, not that low by, you know, uh, you know, the majority of the Cyprus population in the labor force does, uh, has uh, uh, 
high school education, as far as I understand. And the same is true in many uh, Southern European countries. In the United States at the time, it was the majority also now. It's the college graduates are exceeding that a little bit. But but this huge social group is re experiencing real wage declines. And those are even worse for people with less than uh, high school education. For women, the real wage declines are somewhat smaller because women are making gains relative to men, but the inequality increases the same. Now, my own work, especially with Pascual Restrepo over the last decade, has argued that this has technological causes. So here we do a particular decomposition. I can't go into the details too much, but the decomposition is very intuitive. And we look at the effects, two types of effects of technology. The dashed line is displacement, when workers are being displaced from their jobs because of technological changes, for example, due to automation or offshoring. And on the top is what we call reinstatement, changes in technology that puts workers back into the production function uh, in a critical way. On the left, you see that there's both rapid automation and rapid other types of technological changes. But the two are counterbalancing each other. So the sum of the two, essentially, the middle thick blue line is hovering around zero. This is the reason why labor demand grew fast. Productivity grew and labor demand followed it. But on the right, you see a sea change. The dashed line goes negative much faster. The black line becomes much less rapid in its ascent. And as a result, the sum of the two, the thick blue line goes south. So in other words, what we are experiencing over the last three decades is that technology has become much more unbalanced. We do much more automation and much less of everything else. Why this bias towards automation? There are many reasons for it. The tech companies, the big tech has a role. Global competition has a role. Perhaps the education system, I'm not entirely sure. But what I'm going to focus on, since this is a talk about fiscal policy, is the role of fiscal policy. Again, I'm going to show you the data from the US, but the same is true for pretty much all OECD economies with some complications, which is that we tend to tax labor much more heavily than capital. Capital has a favored position because it's globally mobile. It can avoid taxes through a variety of means. And going back in the US in the 1980s and 1990s, taxes were much lower on capital. Or effective taxes on equipment and software were around 15%. But now uh, they have become even smaller. Whereas labor, labor, uh, labor taxes are, have been around 25%. So today, capital and equipment are at 5%, and some companies can actually get rebates when they tax, when, when they invest in capital uh, goods. So that creates a huge imbalance between capital and labor and is at the root of some of the bias towards automation that I am indicating. This bias, again, as the other ones that I'm talking about, I'm going to mention briefly, is being accelerated by COVID. If you ask companies, they say they are considering to invest more in automation, or they have already done so, 75% of companies. Why? Because the virus and social distancing make humans even more troublesome. But the future does not need to be automated, and we do not need to put up with declining labor demand and lower wages. There are many different uses of AI, digital technologies, and so on, and many of them are cooperative with humans. They increase human productivity, just like the reinstatement effect that I showed you in this graph. So in other words, the picture here on the left is not an aberration. It's something we can achieve, but we have to work to achieve it. So this is one other aspect of all of the transformation that we need to undertake, some of them you have heard from other speakers, and I wanted to talk a little bit about this technological inequality aspect, which has uh, not achieved as much attention. And it's particularly important for economies like Cyprus, because many people may have a, uh, a, a complacent attitude and thinking that these automation technologies such as AI and so on will not impact economies uh, in uh, the Southern Europe and in uh, uh, in the middle income category for quite a while yet, but that's actually wrong because when automation happens rapidly in Germany, in the United States, in uh, Japan, it will change what tasks and what jobs are available in throughout the world. So it is something that will have major implications. So putting all of this together, uh, what I conclude uh, and here, the broader aspects of inequality, including health inequality, including failure in the government uh, procedures for dealing with 
pandemics, dealing with regulation and so on, which I haven't had time to go. But putting all of them together, I would say we are in the midst of what James Robinson and I call the critical juncture. Existing institutions are inappropriate for dealing with the challenges, but the direction of change is uncertain and contingent. And to emphasize that, I want to briefly mention four different futures we could end up with. We could have essentially go along where along the same path as we are on right now, which is what I call tragic business as usual. Nothing changes, but the increase in inequality, failure in uh, institutions and the eroding trust in institutions would make this very bad. We could try a china light strategy, which is we could learn the wrong lessons from the crisis about the superiority of non-democratic institutions, try to weaken media freedom, civil liberties, democracy. But this would be a huge failure as well uh, for many reasons. Some of them people recognize, but there's one that people don't seem to recognize. We could actually not even emulate China. Chinese bureaucracy uh, learned how to deal with an autocratic structure over 2,500 years for any country, and some countries in Africa try to do that, when they try to emulate China, they don't get the bureaucratic efficiency. They just get the clamping down on civil freedoms. Or we could learn yet another lesson, which is the, what I would call a silicon government. We could say, well, governments are not good. They're failing. We see that all around us. We should give more power to corporations, especially to uh, tech com corporations. But of course, that would be the wrong lesson as well, because it won't strengthen our social safety net, it won't strengthen regulation, it will increase inequality, and it won't do anything for redirecting technological change, which I have put as an urgent item on the, on the list. Instead, I think what we need to do is uh, what I call welfare state 3.0, which is strengthen the social safety net, but even more responsibilities on the shoulders of governments, and in particular two of them should be pretty obvious from the talk that I have given so far. One is, you know, we live in a more global world, like the pandemics, we're going to have more global challenges and we have to deal with them. So that's a, uh, that's a responsibility that was sort of present when, for example, the European Union was being constructed in Europe, but was not as central. It is more critical today. And second, the regulation of technology, AI, automation, robotics, they all need to be regulated. They cannot be just left to the whims of a few entrepreneurs and big companies in Silicon Valley. So that is a completely new set of responsibilities on the shoulders of the state. But at this point, you may say, and you should say, hang on, isn't that a problem? Can we uh, can we really survive making the state even bigger? They're already big. Many countries have debt levels that are very high. And who's going to monitor the monitor? Who's going to keep tabs on the state? And that's the sort of issue that uh, a very, very important social scientist, Friedrich von Hayek, worried about uh, when the Beveridge Report in the UK came out in 1942, which was the uh, signature uh, intellectual basis of the welfare state that evolved in Britain and much of Europe later on. But Hayek said, hang on, hang on, hang on, you cannot do that because if you make the state so highly powerful, administratively uh, interfering uh, and set up a welfare state, then you're going to set up a totalitarianism. And that's what led to his road to serfdom. But and here I will conclude, this is my last slide. This is actually the topic of my more recent book with uh, James Robinson. Uh, the narrow corridor, we uh, develop a broad framework. And at the end, we come back to the question of whether Hayek was right. And the broad framework, which of course I don't have time to summarize, uh, is sort of uh, represented by this figure, which is, and it's also epinomous with the book, the narrow corridor. In the middle, you see the corridor. That's where the power of the state and power of society are balanced. That's where liberty, democracy, new ideas, new, new technologies must uh, critically flourish. And that balance is very important. And when that balance is not present, you end up with the sorts of things that Hayek was worried about, such as despotism or complete atrophy of state institutions. But within that corridor, you have very different dynamics, which is what we call the Red Queen effect. Society and state run together, and in running together with each other, they both become stronger and deeper, and they check each other. And that's really what uh, the reason why Hayek turned out to be wrong. He thought that the state would get stronger, but society would become meeker, weaker in the face of a more uh, interfering state. But of course, as anybody who knows the history of Europe would recognize, European democracy became much deeper 
political participation increase as bureaucratic capacity of the states increased rather than society giving in to the state, they became much more demanding of the state. So that's exactly the Red Queen effect. So then the key, okay, and must, I will end uh, it here. Must, uh, wrap it up, uh, Professor. Yes, I am, Thank that's you. my last sentence. Uh, and uh, the key question for Welfare State 3.0 is whether we can find a way for the democratic institutions to become stronger and again counterbalance these new responsibilities that are going to be put on the shoulders of the state. Thank you.